Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. We're in the midst of November, and today I'm checking in with my daughter, Sarah, for our annual mother-daughter read. We both use challenges to motivate our reading, and what challenges did you did, oh my, what challenges did you do, Sarah? I have two this year, one I'm going to finish and one I am probably not. <laughs> one was a Storygraphs Read the World Challenge, and it picked 10 different countries outside the U.S. and U.K., and one was based on words in the title. That is the one I will probably not finish. Some of them got a little bit obscure. Oh, okay. I And I'm just the opposite of you. I also did two story graph ones, and I'm doing horribly on my Read the World Challenge. Um, and I did one called In Case You Missed It, which was kind of fun. It was a book from, like, each month you did a book from, like, 2022, 2021. So we went back, like, 12 years to kind of pick up books Ooh. that you may have missed the first time around. So that one was fun, and I've done all but two in that one. Question, what's Storygraph? Oh, Storygraph is another thing like Goodreads, okay. where you can keep track of your reading, but it also gives you a lot of – actually, Sarah got me to join this. Um, it gives you a lot of, like, statistics for what you read. Gotcha. Yeah, so it – like this year, I decided I wanted to read more nonfiction, and it tells you, like, oh, so far cool. I'm reading, like, 13%. And, like, this year my leading category is literary, which is really surprising. It's usually, like, historic or mystery, so. Nice. Yeah. But, um, yes, and it's not owned by Amazon, so oh. you can feel good about it. <laughs> but, so I'm going to... Start with my first one. The other thing is you and I both do Book of the Month Club. So a lot of times we either yeah. pick a book together or, you know, we'll pick one lately, like we pick one and then swap it later. Like after I finish, I give it to Sarah and, you know, vice versa. So, but I think and we both finished our Book of the Month challenge and got our silly hats. Yes. <laughs> oh, we should have worn our silly hats. We should have worn the hats. <laughs> oh. So my first one is called The Lion Women of Tehran by Marjan Kamali. And this one was interesting because it was women of, of Iran, which you, I personally have not read a lot about that country or women in that country. And it was set in the 1950s through like the 70s and 80s. So really mama's jam, you know, the historical um, but it follows two friends, a girl named Ellie and a girl named Homa. They meet um, their com completely different backgrounds. Ellie, I believe, is the more wealthy, but her father dies, so her mom and she have to move to kind of like a low-income apartment. But at school, she meets a girl named Homa. They become very good friends. They visit a lot. But her Ellie's mom is really determined to get back to that wealthier lifestyle. She misses it. So she ends up marrying her husband's brother. So Ellie and Homa are separated. Um, Ellie starts going to an exclusive school. Um, but then Homa gets a scholarship and their lives intersect again. And that's kind of the way this book goes, is these two girls have this friendship, but they are, you know... They move apart. They come back together. Like Ellie is going the much more traditional route. She's going out in society. She gets a a, a nice boyfriend. She's going to get married early. Whereas Homa starts falling in with, what would you say, like rebels? <laughs> this is also set during the time of the Iranian Revolution. So well, yeah, she's part of the more socially liberal crowd. Yes, yes, we'll we'll say that. But um, so. What happens is there's, I don't want to give away the plot, but there is a betrayal. So these two girls, the friendship falls out, but then they meet again later in life in a totally, I think in, a, in the United States, right? Wasn't the one lady working at either Macy's? I read this a while ago, so I'm trying to remember. But um, it was really interesting. For one, I learned a lot about what that culture is, how women are treated there, and just the importance of, of friendship over the years. So I really liked this one. I probably gave it like a four, 4.5 out of five. Did you like it as well? I did like that one a lot. Yeah. 
So I thought Ellie was a little naive, more than a little naive. But um, other than that, I think that... To be. Pardon me? <laughs> I think she was supposed to be. <laughs> yes. So um, that was like my only criticism, I think, of the book. But I would definitely read another book by this author. As a matter of fact, I have one sitting on my shelf. So that's going to be a next year thing. <laughs> In the pile of shame. In the pile of shame. That's right. <laughs> oh, so what's your first one, Sarah? I picked Under the Whispering Door Okay. by T.J. Plume. I think I, w I was a little late to this party, I think. I don't think this was a new release. No, it wasn't a new release, but I read it this year, too, so we were both late to that particular party. Yeah, T.J. Klune should win an, a book break award this year. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think a lot of people have mentioned different books by him. Yeah. No. So. I would definitely read more after reading this one. It was uh, a From Beyond the Grave story of sorts, um, but I feel like a lot of books like that tend to lean into like the spooky depressing bent and this was more heartwarming and whimsical right um, yeah yeah it's uh about a man who's a little bit maybe too attached to his job and is definitely kind of a jerk who passes away unexpectedly and finds himself at Charon's crossing which is a tea shop and bake shop but also the place where the ferryman helps you cross on to what's supposed to be next. Um, but Wallace isn't ready to go. So it's about his adventure and how he changes while he's there. It was very cute. You will ugly cry. I do recommend buying a fresh box of tissues and also not finishing it at 7 a.m. before you go to work, which is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I like that one too. It, it definitely fits in. I think a lot of people are looking for those cozy fantasy vibes and, and that one fit the bill. Um, I thought there were parts of it that were really funny too. Kind of reminded me a little bit of A Christmas Carol in a way because you don't yeah. have the, the three spirits visiting, but there are other people that come to the house, like other residents of the house. One of them is the ferryman's father. There's um, a dog, right? The the guy had a yeah. dog. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I like that one. I think that one actually is my favorite one that I've read by him so far. So I still got to read the the house and the robot or something, but um, I like that one. Did you read the house and the cerulean sea? No, but it's on my list. Yeah, you've got to read that one. I like that one too. So, all right. Well, my next one, I'm gonna kind of deviate and and do something a little bit different. You, I don't think you read this one. This is one that I listened to in audio, probably on one of my recent trips. It's called Help Wanted by Adele Waldman. And I saw it, it was on Barack Obama's 2024 summer reading list. And regardless of politics, Barack Obama is an avid reader and he usually has some pretty interesting picks on his list. And I saw this one and I hadn't heard of it. And I was like, huh, I, um, and it was available on Libby. So I popped it in and did the audio book. But um, it was also named a New York Times, like, book review editor's choice. But here's the setup. If, if you've ever worked, like, a mind-numbing retail job, you will identify with this book. Because it's, um, it's kind of a comedy satire in a way. It, it's, it's a cast of many people. But they're working at this big box store that they call, oh, I forget what it's called. I keep wanting to say Target because to me that's what it seemed like when I was reading this book. But um, so the, they're all on the line and they're unpacking the trucks and so forth. And you have the, the politics of the store manager suddenly is getting promoted. So they all realize there's a chain of opportunity happening here and little coalitions form and people are pushing forward their candidate, hopefully, you know, hoping that they'll get, you know, the permission, uh, promotion to the next step. So it's, it's almost like this little Machiavellian village <laughs> of intrigue of people like messing up other people's tables and, and, you know, just doing stupid stuff, but you can so relate to it. Like you would, you worked at Bath and Body Works with me, right? Years ago. Oh, I, I sure did. <laughs> 
And, and that's all I thought of was us doing those night sets and the people that didn't work and, you know, getting so mad at some of the silliest things. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought that was the beauty of it. Like, it would be hard to recommend or explain this book to somebody because so much of it was kind of reminded me of like the Seinfeld show where they say the show is about nothing. Right. It was like this book was about nothing, yeah. you know. Um, but yet I liked it. And I liked, you do get to know these different characters and you see them more as people and what their individual struggles were. Um, like, you know, somebody was once in prison and, you know, you have other people that are single parents that are trying to juggle these, you know, childcare and this and that and why they can't perform and why some people, I don't know, seem to succeed. It was um, it was really interesting. I really liked it. Um, I did root for some of the characters and other ones I was getting really irritated with. So anytime a book makes me feel something, mm -hmm. I feel like it's a successful book. So, yeah, I really Sounds like good. this one. Yeah, I think you might like it too. Has a little bit of snarkiness to it. So not I that you're, like that. Yeah, not that you're <laughs> snarky or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Only sometimes. <laughs> no. Genetically, it works, right? <laughs> it does. What's your next Ooh, one? Genetic, genetics is a good segue. Um, my next book, I we both read. I really liked it, and you did not like it. I read your scathing 2.5 star <laughs> review of it um, when I was refreshing my notes. Uh, it was Real Americans by Rachel Kong. Um, it's a multi-generational tale. It starts with the grandmother, May, in China. And then she makes her way to America and it switches perspectives to her daughter, Lily, who lives in New York. And then you pick up with the grandson, Lily's son, Nick, to finish out the book. Mm -hmm. So it kind of trailed through. Um, the big undercurrents are like immigration, identity, polit politics, but also how much control do you have over your own life? How much is figured out for you and how much are you allowed to move the pieces and figure it out? but also how much control should you have? Um, there's a lot of talk about like the ethics of manipulating genetics and mm. how far could we or should we go there? And what are the impacts of that that people might not think of? If you liked the 1997 classic film Gattaca, this mm. might be for you. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> you, you might like Real Americans. Yeah. The more I hear about Rachel Kong, the more I feel I get like Don DeLillo vibes. And I really like Don DeLillo. Okay. And, uh, but dealing with those same broad topics like eugenics or, you know, technology, yeah. things like that. I love that. Sorry to interrupt. No, I think you would like this book, actually, mm -hmm. the more I, I hear about it. And, you know, to, to answer to my 2.5 scathing review, <laughs> I, I... All of the characters were irritating, she said. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for taking the words right out of my mouth. No, I was expecting, I think, a family drama or saga, kind of pachinko-like. I haven't read that one, but I was thinking of oh, that. Pachinko. That whole, pachinko is amazing. Yeah, okay, and, and I got to read that one. But that whole, I think the gene thing, the gene therapy and whatever, and, and that, I don't want to go into the plot line because that's a definite spoiler, but that really threw me for a loop. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely not a family drama because all of the family members are a little estranged. Oh, yeah. Like so many yeah. odd things have happened that when you're reading from each person's perspective, you're not really reading about the rest of the family in a way. No, and everybody separate. has their reason to be separate and their reason to be angry, you know, because everybody yeah. interprets what happened differently. So, um I think more yeah. people thought like you, like a lot of people rated this book pretty highly. So I definitely am in the minority here and will admit that, that my review, and I think if I read it again, I may not rate it that low. Like, because I, I think part of it was the shock for me for what happened. Um, yeah. And, and I was looking for more of an emotional connection of the characters. And like Sarah said, that didn't happen because they were all very separate um yeah and the timeline jumped 
between there was like the timelines picked up but they weren't like totally congruent so it was like there were big chunks of time passing Mm -hmm. so you were like thought you knew it was happening and then you were 18 years in the future and you did not know what was happening (laughs) no you you really this is not a book that you could pick up and put down lightly you know you really had to follow along this is a pretty literary read i have not read um she had another one like vitamin c or hello vitamin i think vitamin yeah i have not read that one but i'd kind of be interested to read that because that one was also pretty highly reviewed so um yeah i actually found her on instagram oh really uh, through somebody who was affiliated with her cover art and that was why i ordered the book (laughs) so never say you can't judge a book by your cover because you totally can. can Yes. The cover is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty. So, all right. And I own it, Sean. So, if you oh, want to cool. read it, I, I can bring yeah. it in for you. Great. Yeah. All right. So, my next one. Oh, and this is another kind of historical one. It was called The Beekeeper of Aleppo by Christy Leftieri. It was published in 2019. I did that for that um, In Case You Missed It Challenge. And this one I'm bringing you for Thanksgiving. So, Um, So you can read it too. But this one is a love story kind of of a mother that was blinded by loss and her husband who insists on their survival as they leave Syria and try to get to Europe. Um, I think you read another book about a Syrian refugee, didn't you? The lemon tree one. Uh, as long as the lemon trees grow, I think it was called. Yeah. So that one was excellent too. Okay. So this one. The father, Nuri, is a beekeeper, and his wife, Afra, is an artist. They live a pretty simple life, but they have a very good, like, family and friends in their little community. It's in the Syrian city of Aleppo until, like, Syrian revolution starts to happen. Um, Almost everything they care for is destroyed by war. They're forced to escape, but Afra has seen so much, and as a... She's become blind because of what has happened. Um, So they're embarking on this journey, and you're following them to try to get from Syria through Turkey and then Greece, and then their eventual destination is Great Britain. Um, When Neri was a beekeeper, he was in business with his, I believe it was his cousin, Mustafa, Um, So it was his cousin and business partner, and he has started like another apiary and is teaching fellow refugees in Yorkshire to keep bees. So that's what their end goal is to try to find, you know, to get to him. But as they travel along, they confront not only their own losses, but you meet other people on on the journey with them, one of which is this little boy that they befriend or especially um, Nuri befriends and he kind of reminds him of a child that they had so um, it is very moving it's compassionate it's it's powerful you begin to realize the risks people take to try to get to safety and oftentimes they're held by situations that are far beyond their control luckily this couple had money to kind of bribe and do things but that still didn't give them like they did, they did not escape unscathed. You know, I'll just say that. Right. Um, but it was good, and I would definitely read another book by this author. I have read one other one by her, but um, she has a new one out that I have not read yet. But I think, I think you would like this one, The Beekeeper of Aleppo. So. I'm excited. Okay. Have we done all our books? We're going to, oh, you got one more. Ha- and then we're going to give you more. a surprise. We're going to give you some of our duds of the year. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh. Uh, yeah. My last one um, did not do very well on Goodreads, which I was shocked by. I loved this book. So this is a petition for justice for the mayor of Maxwell Street by Avery Cunningham. Um, it is long, which was a, one of the main complaints about Goodreads, Um, but it is a story set um, during the Jim Crow era, and it starts off in the South being told from the point of view 
of a man who lives there and works as a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And then it moves north to Chicago where our um, protagonist is. Her name is Nellie. So she's a young socialite in a rich um, black family. They're very well to do. They're part of black society. Um, and they're, her older brother dies, leaving her with all of this responsibility. So before this, she had been a little bit of a recluse. She didn't like the social spotlight. It was not her thing. She was hoping to avoid being married off. Her older, more personable brother passes away in a car accident. And now all the, all the lights are on her. Um, but she secretly wants to be a reporter. So she starts seeking out this mob boss, this crime lord called the mayor of Maxwell Street. Because the man that she wants to be a reporter for tells her that the only way that she he'll give her a job as a reporter is if she can do this, thinking it's an impossible task. And she embarks on this preposterous journey. There's everything. There's gangsters. There's guns. There's there's uh, fires. There's um, horse racing. There's speakeasies because it's in the middle of the prohibition. Okay. Um, I thought it had it all. I thought it was very exciting. People complain that she was young and naive and she did stupid things, but she's a teenage girl. And I feel like that was on brand. Um, <laughs> and it had a lot of twists and turns. The end was a little bit predictable. I will say, I think it is clear who the mayor is. I feel like your motive should be more to figure out how he got there okay. and became the mayor. But I thought it was a great book. I think and you... people that reads are wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to read it and I'll throw in my judgment. But uh, to me, it sounds it sounds fun. And plus, the fact you it don't was fun. you don't I don't know. There's not a lot of books written about that time period. So to me, it would be interesting because I'm kind of over that whole World War II thing that so many historical fictions are based yeah. on. Um, so yeah, I'll give it a shot. Well, and I feel like the ones that exist are all set in the South, so it's interesting that it moved northward. Yeah. Did you ever read Passing? No. Oh, you ought to read that one. Who wrote that? Oh, um, I can't think. Get oh, out Get out the Google. Yeah. It's an old book, but it's, a, again, about... I two black friends and one of them can pass for white and the other one can't, oh. but it kind of has that black society vibe. And Larson? yes, okay. yes. I, I read the vanishing half and the, what was the kitty car book? That one was also very good. Oh yeah. What, whatever happened to kitty car? Oh, the vanishing half Britt Bennett actually, I think used passing as inspiration for that book. And I got think it. you and I got that one year. Look, when we first yeah. started Book of the Month Club. Yeah, I like that, that one, too. Won. Did that one Book of the Year? Maybe? It, it might have. It was up there. It was a pretty popular book. She Unvalidated needs to write, facts. <laughs> right. She needs to write another book. I haven't seen another book by her. So, all right. So, we're going to do some fast. Like, it's great when you, you read books that you really like, but sometimes they just don't hit for you. So... I've, I've had more than my fair share, I feel like, of those this year. Or a lot of what I call, like, three stars, like, that was okay, you know. But, yeah. it, you know, nothing that made me really jump for joy. Um, although I did have some, and we're going to talk about that next time. And we're going to get Sean to talk about his, too. Mm -hmm. But um, my first dud was a book I got through, I believe, Book of the Month, as an extra. And it was called Hum by Helen Phillips. And I was really excited about this book. I thought it was going to be like sci-fi, climate change. You know, you have this family and this woman decides to alter her face um, huh. and she gets paid. So to have this surgery so she's not detected in, in any of the surveillance cameras. But um, she makes such stupid decisions with this money that she made that I got so irritated with this woman and really and then she and her husband she pays for this this vacation into this botanical garden her children were also the most irritating people I've ever read about in fiction so she and her husband fall asleep of course she insists that no one brought technology or phones or whatever and the children of course run off and disappear and a robot finds them and then posts this video of this woman and she becomes the social pariah, you know, mm. all because of her stupid decisions. And I'm supposed to feel sorry for her. I don't know. <laughs> it just, uh, <laughs> the premise was good. She was bad, all the other characters. And, and the ending, it was like kind of like a, an ending where you would go, what 
in the name of God was that. <laughs> so, yeah, that that was my my take on Hum by Helen Phillips. <laughs> so what was your first dud? My first dud, oh, actually all three of my duds are book of the month books, so <laughs> that's unfortunate. <laughs> my first dud was Hera by uh, Jennifer Smith, maybe. What was it called, Sarah? Hera. 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 It was uh, Jennifer the... Saint. Saint. Yeah, Jennifer Saint. I think she's I was written. Really... Yeah. She... What were you saying? I think she's written other books of about mythology too. That's kind of like her 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 niche or whatever her thing. Yeah, I was really excited because it's supposed to be a retelling from the perspective of the goddess Hera, and we had read. Clytemnestra last year or the year before and we yeah. both loved it which is a different author but similar idea Greek time period I was like it'll be similar it'll be so great and I really just hated this book I think I spiked finished the book Hera is just the most unlikable egotistical horrible person you could ever imagine this retelling did her no favors it did not float my boat at all and it was just so petty it was it was 300 pages of petty it was oh, bad <laughs> oh my yeah and i still got that one sitting on my shelf so that's not doing anything for making me get that one off my to be read list <laughs> don't donate it there was nothing redeeming <laughs> <laughs> i might just donate when that and be done with it um yeah. my next one was an author i was giving a second chance to and i've decided i've done with him now um and it was called the life impossible by matt Haig, mm -hmm. and i really a lot of people love the midnight library i was not one of those people but i thought you know what i'm, I'm gonna give this a shot um again you know got it through book of the month club so i actually paid for this which is why i think i spite finished it thinking surely this must get better Surely it must. No. So this was about a, an older woman. She's a retired mathematics teacher. She, she had a colleague years and years ago who, of course, decides to will her her vacation home in um, this, this island, as one does. I Ibza, I think. <laughs> I mean, one, who does this happen to? So anyway, she goes to the vacation home. She discovers, like, some strange alien presence in the water, an unethical plot to destroy the nature of the island. And it, to be honest, it just went from preposterous to unbelievable to just downright weird. <laughs> and I just couldn't care for her. And she's tr trying to, just, to write this manuscript. I, I just, by the end, I was like, oh... Oh my, yeah. So unfortunately, that was how I felt about that book. I don't even think I passed that one on to you. So that sounds like it was for the best. <laughs> I do have Midnight Library sitting in my pile of shame, so. Yeah. Well, maybe read that one over definitely over the life impossible. So All right. My second one was my like light fluffy romance pick for the year. It was called The Ornithologist Field Guide to Love. I thought it would be fun. It would be a romance. There would be birds. It was not fun. I feel that my IQ may have dropped from reading this book. It was so insipid. And there were not even real birds. They made up fake birds. It was magic birds. They were hunting birds. The birds were weird. It was oh, her arrival. No. It, was just, it was every trope in the book. And it was just not, it was just not, not it. <laughs> Oh, I'm really disappointed about that. It'll I was, be a movie watch. Yeah. They, they might make it a movie. Yeah. One of the birds was a whopper swan, and it was a swan that would make noises at a certain pitch and blow out people's eardrums. It was just bizarre. It was a little too strange. <laughs> wow. Okay. So my last one was another book I've read by an author that I've read before that I liked, and it was called Family Family by Laurie Frankel. And I, I don't know, it just, it started okay, but there was a, a woman, she um, got pregnant when she was a teenager, she ended up giving up the baby for adoption, which I get. But then four years later, she finds herself in the same position, and it was like, 
did you learn nothing about this whole situation? Uh, you know, again, gives it up for adoption, but then decides she wants her own child and then moves along. And again, the storyline to me just got so convoluted. And I didn't like how the whole thing about adoption was like from her vo viewpoint. And she was, she was also, did I mention she was a very successful like Broadway actress and writer. So I felt... It was like, well, this is not how adoption normally is. I would have rather seen something a little more real, something a little more real from the adoptee's viewpoint. Um, and that just didn't happen for me. So I've read other books by her that I've really liked, but um, I guess the plot and circumstances of this one just didn't, didn't do it for me. So what was your last one? I have a feeling this is the one that we had together. I didn't like this one either. <laughs> this was my most hate hated book of the year. It was The Fury by Alex mm. Michelades. Yeah. I, I'm probably pronouncing it, the last name incorrectly. Uh, this book was so bad, it put me off thrillers. I'm on a thriller hiatus indefinitely. Um, it just... I don't. I don't know how to complain about it without giving away the plot. If one of you wants to put yourself through it, but it wasn't good. <laughs> well, to to kind of sum it up, it was almost like The Bachelorette meets Survivor. Yeah. Right. There this, is a, this is how deep this book was. Um, yeah. It was a, there's an ex movie star, and somehow everyone ends up on a private island in Greece, as as one does. Um, and everything goes wrong from there. But the characters are all horrible. The person who did it very obviously did it. I felt just like yeah. reeked of sociopath. It wasn't. <laughs> what, what <I'm> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of feel like Alex Michelides, he wrote The Silent Patient, which a lot of people really loved, and has just kind of slid downhill from there for me. You know. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. And that's Sorry, another Alex. one. No, I, yeah, I hope none of these people ever watch the show. But, <laughs> but I also am kind of off thrillers. It, I find a lot of them, it's just, it's all been done. You know, the unreliable yeah. narrator, the, the, the secluded island, unless, you know, they're taking like an Agatha Christie thing and just beating it to death, you know. Yeah. So I've done like five unreliable narrators and three islands in the last blitz and this was the one that killed them this was it <laughs> that was the one that just put you off it for the rest of the year at least yep so yep <laughs> oh well sarah thank you for joining us um it was a lot of fun to talk books with you and i'm so glad that we yeah. can read and talk books together so i encourage any other after we did our last one there was a mother and daughter that wrote on Facebook that they were going to start kind of a mother-daughter book club. So I hope I hear from them again and hear how it went. So, Oh, that's fun. We're inspiring. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, thanks so much for joining us. As always, I'll have the links to the books we talk about in our show notes. We're going to have... Even just, the duds? Even the duds. Even the duds. Because you know what? Just because it's not for us doesn't mean somebody else is going to love it. Yeah, you know, that's, know if you like any of the duds. Yeah, that's, that's the way the world rolls. So, yeah, and, and if you like the duds, tell me why. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Sometimes I'd need to rejudge things. So, But we're just going to have one book break episode in December, and it's going to be our best of 2024. We're going to recap our year. It's going to be Librarian Molly, Sean, and myself. So I hope that everyone has a happy Thanksgiving, and I hope you find some books to read that you are truly thankful for. So thanks for joining us. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.